amazing event today. Now, let me give you a background to this event. This event is actually a series. So it is called the Digital Identity Series, you know, organized by D and CIS. Now, the, the entire thing is actually Nigeria's digital identity project. Are we ready? So it's a question to us. It's a question to the stakeholders. It's a question to the right holders in the entire ecosystem. So, and to do that, every single month from the month of July, looking at our readiness as a country, you know, as a people for the digital identity project. And of course, for the month of July, 2021, we have a, a topic titled Nigeria's Digital Identity, the Blueprint. Now, this morning, this afternoon, and this evening, depending on your time in your location around the world. So we'll be having two important panelists joining us. And of course, you can bear it with me that we can't have anybody discussing, you know, the Nigeria's Digital Identity Project, you know, better than, of course, the agency that is, that is um, saddled with responsibility of implementing the DI project in Nigeria. And of course, most Nigerians are aware of the agency called National Identity Management Commission. So if as a Nigerian, you have been issued your NIN or you have been warned by uh, the telco, you know, to go link your NIN with your SIM card, of course, the agency that is, re that is responsible to actually provide you with NIN is NIMSI. And today we are glad to have with us the general manager for legal and regulatory services of that agency. And of course, also from a partner in India, Center for Internet and Research. So uh, before I go ahead, uh, please permit me to welcome you know, for introduction of our partner in India, Sombia Saidu, to make a formal introduction of CIS India. Sombia, how are you this afternoon? Thank you, Solomon. I'm good. I'm very well. How about you? Uh, we can actually just, uh, uh, great, just share. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I can just begin by uh, carrying on about uh, CIS's work on digital identity specifically. So uh, CIS is basically a tech and policy research organization. We are a nonprofit based in India, and uh, we've been working on several issues on tech like privacy, cybersecurity, AI, uh, and so on, freedom of expression, etc. So uh, one of our initiatives in digital identities has been uh, the project that we began almost two years ago now. Uh, the project began with the intention of examining appropriate design choices for digital identity frameworks and what their implications could be in say, civil, social, and economic rights. Uh, with that kind of a basic aim, uh, we kind of had two critical questions around it. One was what should be the appropriate uses of digital identity? Uh, that is, when should ID, digital ID be used? And what should be the principles on the basis of which we should uh, evaluate a digital ID system? Uh, the second critical question in this project has been around technological design of ID. So uh, uh, I'm going to study uh, the technological and policy design choices that uh, we have while creating such systems. Uh, the first part of the question has led us to create an evaluation framework, certain, carry out certain case studies around the world, uh, and kind of also create a lot of, uh, uh, say, study the judicial trends, et cetera, in the ID systems. Uh, the second question has, of course, uh, is, is still under progress. We are about to finish a project and create a decisions guide, which would help uh, people understand what choices in terms of technology and policy one should make in order to uh, create a more effective in, in terms of rights and in a more kind of uh, uh, centric to people digital ID system. Thank you. Samia? Hi, Solomon. I have 
Elisavia, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I hope I will okay. close okay. All, right. Yeah. all right, great. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, before we go into the business of the day, because we are not going to waste our time, um, uh, Digital Lawyers Initiative is a not-for-profit, non-governmental organization uh, set up to promote and protect digital rights. And of course, how do we do that? We do that you know, via an acronym I will call LAT. LAT stands for Litigation, Advocacy, Research, and Training. Now, over the past two years, when in, 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 within the space of litigation, we have actually litigated up to about 60 important cases. In fact, I would rather call them strategic cases. And these cases involve online expressions, digital identity, data protection and privacy, and of course, rights to own um, digital assets. Now, and of course, you know, away from that, we have consistently uh, brought the, the whole concept of digital rights to our community of lawyers and of course of all stakeholders within the digital rights space. So, and of course, uh, this morning, this afternoon and this evening, we are starting a series, you know, on digital identity because we realize that this is an important subject. All Nigerians, in fact, all persons in the 21st century society a lot so and that is why we have come your way now so uh, without having to um, spend much time at this stage let the business begin so let me start with some year now your design researcher with CIS and your organization has done some remarkable works in this field. Please, can you just tell us what in essentially is digital identity all about? Thanks, Solomon. So uh, I think in my understanding, uh, an identity actually can be seen as a collection of attributes uh, that could be associated with, the with an individual that could be used to identify or uh, that uh, unique identify that particular individual and in case of digital identities that one can be defined that can be defined as uh, a similar kind of collection of attributes for a, for an individual but in the digital space so uh, you conduct verification you conduct identification authentication and such processes in order to uh, in order to identify that person uh, who they say are that person in, in, uh, that, that person by themselves and also to kind of uh, uh, use the system in order to uh, carry on with say welfare schemes benefits and so on for for a particular country that is i think some uh, very kind of simple examples would be say in india we have the aadhar system which is a unique digital identity uh, number which is given out to uh, individuals uh, based on a certain set of identity proofs and uh, the biometrics of, the, of individuals are collected and then based on this verification and once these uh, these att attributes are further uh, authenticated uh, at several points uh, they get access to different services uh, such as say um, getting uh, an LPG connection, which is a, uh, which is a uh, cooking gas connection, or uh, for say uh, healthcare or for say payment of bills or certain things. Although in India, of course, it's all the uses of the ID system are not mandatory yet, but uh, some of them are still. So in, in several countries, some of these uses could be mandatory. Uh, for instance, uh, I think some other examples could be say in, in how in Nigeria, the ID system would be of the NIN number and the EID card uh, combined together. In several other countries like Estonia, there are also uh, the EID uh, and there are other multiple private digital ID systems. So, uh, and so on, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, um, Samia. And um, of course, I think I will go over to Madam Madize now. Like I intro, um, yeah, um, please permit me to say this. It is a real privilege to have um, to have uh, join us today. It's been um, a long time trying to ensure that we were able to join. Up. But of course, we shifted this program, and of course, and um, 
we had some challenges, but I am indeed grateful that we have that this morning and we are going to have the voice of National Identity Management Commission. So, Madam Adiza, pleased to have you this morning. Good morning and uh, good day to others uh, joining from uh, other jurisdictions. Uh, 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 Hello. Okay, thank you so much. Um, much recently, I think December last year, the federal government um, directed that all Nigerians who operate mobile phones or who use SIM card should their SIM card. Now, that was the first time they were coming across the world and it may not be all of them, I said for some. Now, and of course, um, Sonia gave us um, a, 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 an introduction about I mean, for most of our uh, audience who do not understand the concept of digital identity. So, Madam, can you just please tell us how important will you consider or your agency consider digital identity for Nigerian citizens? How important will you consider it? Okay, thank you very much for the question. I think the question is encompasses the whole essence of why the agency is even in existence. Because uh, when you look at the mandate uh, given by to the NIMC is to register everybody, issue them with um, an identity token and uh, make sure that there's access for verification and uh, authentication of such identities. So digital ID is, um, is something that when you look at um, the preference by most Nigerians, Nigerians always um, kind of uh, prefer to have um, uh, something physical that they can carry. But the world has gone beyond that. Well. And uh, the world has gone beyond that. Most uh, transactions are done uh, digitally. So digital identity, we cannot do without it. The database is uh, a digitalized registry. So even though we issue uh, physical tokens, we still have to, the means for identifying those uh, tokens are digital. So what NIMSI did there was, is um, to, stay, uh, to look back, to re-strategize on how it is going to deliver its mandate. The, um, the law did not say, it's, the law says issues a nat national identification number. It didn't say in what form you are going to issue it. Digital mm -hmm. national identification number, that's the identity. Even though we started with paper base, but in reality, it is a digital number. The paper in which the number is printed is just for easy convenience for other for people and for people that uh, may not be able to go on the internet, at least they have something physical in their hands. So from the from the law, when you look at the NIMSI Act. It already encouraged us to do that. So, and that's what we are emphasizing on now, the digital identity, to try as much as possible to change the mindset of people in reliance to uh, paper token or card-based uh, documentation. Because even the card, when you look at the mobile app that we have just launched, there's a digital card, e-card, that you can carry with you anytime, anywhere in addition to the digital number that you have. So digital uh, identity is, um, is the key to economic development and uh, for easy transactions also. So NIMSI, I, I can say it's 100% uh, behind um, issuance of uh, digital IDs. Thank, thank you, Madam Adiza. And um, just like you said, uh, today, we live in a world that is now digitalized. Almost every single we do, every daily engagement, interaction, transaction we have, you know, happens in the digital space. So we cannot actually be left behind. And the reality is now if we decide not to actually take on the challenge and actually go with the realities of our world, of our society, then of course, someday we wake up and realize that we actually not in, in the society we should live. Now, so um, I'll come over to you right away. Now, I want to know, to what do you consider, what will you consider are important elements of a successful 
digital identity project. Now, what we consider to be an important element that a society, a state, a government needs to put in place. Uh, sorry, sorry. Sonia, did yeah, you hear me? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Uh, right. So I think, uh, I mean, uh, at CIS, we have okay. kind of formulated an evaluation framework in order to assess this very question. Uh, because one is to understand that there are going to be several like necessary uh, components per se to a digital ID system, whereas you set up an NTD system, you have, uh, you know, means of identifications, means of authentication, uh, you know, several kind of networks in place. Uh, those are kind of infrastructural uh, kind of considerations to look at when you're creating a digital ID system. Uh, but uh, we have specifically also tried to look at how to evaluate a digital ID framework, which is to say that when you create laws or when you create uh, you know, uh, a legal kind of backing to an ID system, what should be looked at? Uh, what are the components there that one should be kind of, uh, you know, uh, looking at or making sure that are in place? So uh, in that case, we've kind of come up with a set of three-pronged kind of a framework. So one is a, a rule of law tests, and the second one is the right space test, and the third one is the risk-based test. So uh, as you can kind of imagine, the, the rule of law test basically looks at legislative mandates. It looks at, at whether the ID system has a legitimate aim or not. And uh, it also looks at defining the actors and purposes of the ID system uh, in a very clear and precise manner. So it also, the kind of general understanding of this uh, test is, is to say that uh, a legislative system should be creating uh, the the, in more detail, the system as opposed to an executive uh, body. Uh, for instance, like what is the what is the clarity or what is the uh, kind of uh, specificity in with which the law has been determined in order to regulate this digital ID system? Is the scope limited, or is the kind of is is the scope clear and precise or not for each actor within that system as well? Uh, then are there redressal mechanisms in place? Uh, do users get notified when any of their data is being, or any of their transaction happens through the digital ID system? Uh, do they get notified when there is a data breach by any chance? Uh, is there, are there, can the users or the individuals access or correct their data or their information in the digital ID system or in any other kind of data set that is part of the digital ID system? Uh, what are the due processes in place? So uh, uh, this also extends to kind of accountability, which means that are there uh, governing bodies, are there kind of uh, institutions in place which can handle any kind of grievances or uh, who is handling the data? Are the people who are handling the data the same as the people who are collecting or storing the data? So what are their respective kind of uh, jurisdictions? Uh, another kind of important thing to understand here is, uh, is to understand mission creep which is basically uh, the purpose, the intended purpose of the digital ID system. And is it being used for that specific purpose or is it kind of, uh, has kind of evolved into a new function which may or may not be legislative or uh, described clearly in the, in the law. So those are the kind of very, very briefly the uh, rule of law tests. Uh, the second uh, thing that we looked at was the right space test, uh, which is basically uh, to understand uh, how the rights of people are being protected in the law, uh, that, uh, that is kind of uh, the digital ID law that is. Um, one of the important thing here is, is uh, how uh, uh, is, there, uh, is it necessary and proportionate, which means that uh, are the privacy violations, uh, are there any privacy uh, violations arising from digital ID use? And uh, if, if there are such, then are they proportionate to the uh, purpose of the ID? For instance, uh, how should you measure uh, the benefits of the ID and the privacy violations that it may cause. Uh, similarly, there is um, data minimization. So making sure that whatever the processes that are part of the digital ID system, you minimize the uh, amount of data collected, stored and retained. Uh, do people have access to make corrections? Do they have access to kind of control what information gets deleted, shared, etc.? cetera? Uh, are people getting excluded through the different mechanisms? Making sure that if the ID system is meant for everybody, then everybody gets to use it. 
there can be various ways and exclusions can happen. For instance, if, if there is restricted network in certain places, if there is a, a certain amount of infrastructure that is needed that people do not have access to, or if in case difficult for sometimes people to um, record their biometrics, all of these factors can cause exclusion. Um, another thing is the mandatory use of digital ID system several times and uh, whether or not uh, the aim kind of justifies that mandatory use. Um, thirdly, there is the risk-based test, uh, which means that how do you assess the risks that are involved in uh, applying this digital ID system and to what extent uh, are these risks kind of um, necessary? So uh, there can be privacy harms, mandatory harms. Uh, when data is anytime collected, there can be you know several ways of uh, kind of using that data. So there can be profiling done. There can be discrimination based on that profiling of the, of the personal data that is collected in the digital ID kind of mechanisms. Um, another thing is basically to um, again see whether uh, the severity or the likelihood. Uh, or the nature of these risks uh, are kind of worth the benefits or not to always weigh in these kind of uh, risks. Uh, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll probably stop here for now, but, uh, but yeah, this is kind of my understanding of what the uh, necessary Yeah, thank you. mentioned quite a number of things and um, my observation is that most of the issues you raised revolve around one thing and that is the legal framework and of course because you actually talked about uh, rule of law you talked about violation you talked about data be duly provided for you know by a, a, a an adequate you know legal instrument now, so I will actually go over to Madam Adisa now. So our audience will want to know what is the state of the legal framework for digital identity in Nigeria? Madam Adisa. Hello. Hello. Oh, yes, I, have had, um, I have had the last speaker uh, enumerated in details the principles for data protection. And um, as regards to the national identity, Nigerian national identity, there's already, it started, before it started, there was a legal framework that was established, which is the NIMSI Act. So NIMSI Act details all the legal requirements. Most of the issues she discussed are already in the NIMSI Act. Most of the principles of data protection are in the NIMSI Act. And um, in addition to that, the NIMSI is working with other stakeholders on the, under the legal working group constituted by the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria to make sure that uh, the data protection law for the country is, um, is passed. So we are at the state of drafting. We have done a stakeholder workshop on that. And um, hopefully before the end of the year, the bill should be by the, at the National Assembly. So, okay. And then uh, the bill- okay. Thank you so much, uh, Madam. Before you but, go- um, um, so, uh, let, me, let me conclude on this. Um, when you look at the National Identity Management yes. System, before the system, was started. We started with um, a privacy impact assessment across the country to hear the views of most Nigerians as to regards to collection and processing of their data. So that impact assessment was done, uh, which uh, and then the uh, privacy policy follows before even the creation of the NIMSI Act. So the NIMSI Act came on board and how the National Identity uh, Management Commission designed the whole system is to design it with privacy in mind, privacy uh, by design. 
from the systems, the processes, and the human resources that we use, privacy was at the back of it. Um, we have we learned from the previous exercise that happened. There's a um, joint key project that was done for Nigeria. We learned from it in terms of security, infrastructure, knowledge gap, and the rest of it. So what we did was to make sure that when we were starting uh, the National Identity Management System, the NIMS, we make sure that um, our uh, we will not be vendor lock in. So we make sure that our systems, even at the point of design, have security in mind, the security of the system, the interoperability of the systems, and the, to make sure that these systems are controlled 100% operated in Nigeria by Nigerians, and uh, training, ad, they receive adequate training. Uh, the same thing, our processes, we, we have to make sure that our, our processes are up to international standards. We have to be ISO certified and other relevant certification for our data center. And then for also our card production facility that we have on ground, the card uh, certification, the card industry certification. So we had to go through a lot of that to make sure that um, to make sure that uh, the, the, our system processes and e equipment are, are secured. So the legal framework is there. In addition to the law, we have regulations that guide against uh, how to access the database, how the uh, information is gathered and stored in the national identity database, how we are even going to harmonize with other stakeholder agencies that are holding data. So all those rules, regulation, and, and um, framework, the legal and regulatory framework were put in place. And um, for the regulations, they are always updated. At least we want to make sure that they are already, they are up to date to any standard um, that we have internationally. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Madam Adiza. Um, uh, okay. Yes. So, so th there's a question here for you. Um, okay. Now, a, a good number of times, as we would say, now the the government told us that NIN is free, but when I had to get enrolled, I had to pay. As a matter of fact, I encountered a fellow yesterday who told me he paid 4,000 Naira and he was asked to come back after three weeks. Now, so the point is that, now, if the agency, if your commission is saying enrollment is free and Nigerians are actually being extorted because that is not about extortion, what can they do? What right do the citizens have? How can they communicate across, I mean, get across with your commission? What can they do? Well, I'm glad you said uh, the commission said the uh, enrollment is free. And it is a known fact that we have been spreading this information that is enrollment is free. So if you walk into a center and you pay money, the giver and the taker are guilty of the same thing. Because it is by paying the money, you are encouraging the extortionist to continue to extort. Yes, let us be frank, let us be free. You can't tell me, because you are in a hurry. We have been enrolling since 2012. And you are just coming out in 2021. And you want to have the need now and then. You failed to do that almost eight years ago. When we were begging people to come to our centers, you failed to do that. Now that there's a need that you cannot do some transactions and you require the need, you want to pay the usual Nigerian way. You are always in a hurry. You are always in a hurry to get service. You don't want to. You don't want to follow a queue to wait. I have more than four thousand systems spread across the federation uh, under this uh, digital ID ecosystem. The government is paying three hundred and fifty naira for each name generator, and in this three hundred and fifty naira, they make a profit of almost one hundred and fifty naira on it because. By estimates, when you buy equipment over a period of six year, six months, when you do a certain number of enrollment, you will be able to recoup the cost of your invest, uh, investment. So there's already profit in what we are giving them. And they are charging you 
20 times what we are what we are giving them and because you want to get your son you want to get it quick quick as uh, no, you you don't want you don't want any stress you pay them so the problem is the giver but the moment you continue to want fast service and give to them they will continue to exhort the general public so i don't want uh, you know i i used to be worried when people report these things to me but I'm becoming, I'm, I'm becoming indifferent because if we don't encourage it, if you go and somebody asks you for, for, for money, report to NIMSI. Report to NIMSI. Report to us that, tell them I'm not going to register. Enrollment is, government said enrollment is free, but if you are charging me, I will report to your company, snap the location, eh? snap the location, snap the office at their self that is asking you the money and get back to us. And you see what we will do because we have we have so many uh, mystery shoppers going around between NIMSI staff, between NIMSI inspectors unit, the ICPC and the EFCC going around detaining people. We had we had our staff paraded for collecting money on national television. So why can't you, as a citizen, it is everybody's responsibility, every Nigerian responsibility to stop the extortion. So don't give. But if you give, don't complain to us. That's my that's my answer to that. Hello, are we still on? So I think there seems to be some delay, but we can hear you. Yes. Okay. It's like the moderator is off. I right. can't see him anywhere. It might be a connection trouble. Um. Okay, sorry. I will maybe let me just read the questions that I've seen here. Mm -hmm. Nigerians value paper based need ID because banks and other government agencies like CST still request for paper based and NIN ID before they are allowed to carry out their day-to-day -day activities. Nigerians will not value paper-based ID if banks and government do not request for it. Yes, we know Nigerians value paper-based ID, so we have communicated to the relevant um, regulatory agencies uh, operating within Nigeria to tell them the importance of the digital ID and how even if they have the paper ID, they still have to verify that paper ID digitally. So the, the need for acceptance of the digital ID and also uh, verification of the paper ID that is presented. So that's where we are. And then there's another question. My husband did his NIMSI providing his correct details, but the NIMSI was captured with the wrong date of birth. He made several uh, uh, efforts to rectify it, but it was told to pay 15,000 hands. He left it unrectified. What can he do? What can he do? Because uh, when we do enrollment, the, if you know how the system is designed, it's different from the uh, initial ID project. We have dual monitors. The essence of having the dual monitor is to make sure that when you go for enrollment, you are looking at a screen. You are looking at how your information is being keyed in. You are to make your correction at that point of entry. And before they send that information, they ask you, are the information keyed in correct? And you said, no, yes. And it is sent. So if you come back after that, after going through that process and you fill the form with your date of birth, if you do that after we send the information, you come back to us, then it's, you, are, you want us to do another processing, so you will pay. And the correction is you have to, there are, so there are documents that you, you have to submit to NIMSI. Do, document to prove that, yes, the, 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 the date of birth you want to correct are actually date of birth that the documentation must precede the date of your registration for us to know that it's not a new document that you went to swear in, that you, you want to change your date of birth. We have seen ridiculous requests for date of birth. People that are coming back to us to change their date of birth, they want to be, they want to be younger than their first son self. They want to be, they, their date of birth will show that they were born before they had their first child. We have seen all. We have seen all kind of sorts, and we have seen most of that from those people that don't want to leave service, do not want to retire. 
they want to reduce their aid so that they can continue be, uh, being in service. So what the board of the NIMSI did was to sit back and look at all those issues that were coming up to say, okay, we took a stand. You cannot reduce your age for more than five years. And you can only do it within the two years of your registration, within two years from the first day you registered. That is when you, are, you can come back and correct anything. And when you do the correcting, you correct it once. And mind you, when you correct it, because this is fundamental, we do not erase the corrected information. We leave it. So this is your date of birth when you came to us, and this is when you correct it to so-so date. So we do that. And the 15,000 is processing fee because there's a processing that has to go through. You go, you see, you do an application, submit the relevant documentation. It goes through two departments, get to the DG for final approval, and then get back for the correction to be effected. But if it is genuinely not your mistake, because we have seen a lot of that with the harmonization we are doing with the BBN record that kind of data. Some people were even given uh, years that when you look at them, you know that this is not definite. Somebody of 30 years will be given 70 years of age. You know definitely there's a mistake somewhere. And for BBN modification, those data that we have harmonized from BBN, that we receive from BBN, we don't even charge. We don't even charge for BBN med medication because the, the, you are not the one that first brought the data. The data came from, to us from another agency. So what we do is to do modification and update of your record to take the information that is not in the banking register, uh, complete the identity, this to retake your biometrics. Because what we take from BBN is the basic fingerprints that can identify you, but we have to take the, the complete 10 biometrics to make sure that, um, yes, because we have a standard we have to maintain. So, and the biometrics must meet our standards for identification. That's on that question. So you are back. Well, I thinking, was okay. the questions yes. that you have. Yes. yes. Okay. So um, I'm glad you mentioned something because you actually touched um, a number of areas. And one important area you touched, which, um, which I would love to know, which I would love to know your reaction to is that you mentioned that if anybody needs to record their birth, it could not be you know, more than five years preceding the year they earlier submitted. Now, and a few other conditions attached to that. So now, do we have this information on the website of um, the commission or are this information provided to subscribers when they are being enrolled or when people are being enrolled on the scheme? At what point do they have this information? When you are being enrolled, uh, like I said, you fill a form. So you provide the information from to us. And there's a provision when you before you sign that form that says all the information you will have provided and true and correct. Eh? Based on that enrollment form that you fill, our officers or our licensees type in that information on the system. While they are typing, you have the opportunity of a second screen. It's a dual screen that as they are typing, you are monitoring. And when they finish, they will ask you, are this information correct? You said, yes. You sign off on it as part of the process of enrollment. Huh? So whenever we receive a request for, yes. the, the first thing a complainer will tell you is that your people put in my, my date of birth incorrect. What we do is we go back to retrieve the form that you signed and, and, and signed for us. 99.9 cases of those cases that we have received, with their own hands, they put the date of birth. They want to change the date of birth, maybe because they saw that the name is being harmonized with uh, their personnel records in their place of work. Huh? And they needed to call the, the, the information they gave in their uh, place of work. The age is lower than the true age they gave us in national ID. So they want to align the two. And when you tell me that your, your people did it wrongly, we retrieve the file that you signed. We keep those files. We keep those forms. We retrieve it. I have had reason. There's a particular lady 
that I have had reason to exchange correspondences over 10 times with her in the federal agency with the long letter that uh, a senior person that uh, you, your, your people return, I retrieved, I sent for the file. I photocopied, I sent her. I said, you gave us this date of birth and that is what is exactly on your national ID. Then she started pleading. That please, she wants to change. If you want to change, then go follow the process. This is the process, submit an application. Why you want to change the date of birth or why you want to modify it. If it is actually, if we pick our forms, your forms, and we see that it is actually wrong, we query our staff for doing wrong work. And we don't charge you to do the process. We do it with an apology letter. But if it is done by the person, you can come and pin it on our staff when we have evidence that you are the one that provided. And on the information, all the processes, all our processes are on our website. When you go to our website, you see the requirement for what, what you need to provide for whatever service you require from LIMS. Okay, thank you so much, Madam. Let, let me go over to Samia now. Samia. Yes, Solomon. Now, uh, we, we're actually looking into rectification of personal data on digital identity. Now, do you think there are exceptions? Yes, I, I agree with uh, Madam Adiza. Now, particularly, you know, in Africa, a good number of times, people have reasons to reduce their date of birth, their age, and all of that. And, you know, to, to a large extent, the commission considered this to be the fault of the person, of the registrant. Now, so as an expert working in this field, do you think the, the commission should be justified for asking uh, uh, one for turning down at any point rectification of personal data or DI Two, for charging for rectification of personal data. What do you think? Right, I mean, uh, based on my experience in what has happened in, say, India and the Adhoi system. Sandhya, did you hear me? Right, I could, I could hear you, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Right, so, uh, so, right. so as, as I was saying, uh, based on our experience here in India, there have been several cases of, uh, say, uh, in, inaccurate data occurrences of, say, issues with date of birth, issues with photographs, issues with uh, biometric data as well, facial uh, kind of features as well, uh, sorry, uh, iris scans as well. So uh, I think, and, and many of them have kind of come to us as kind of fraudulent entries in the system and various kind of, you know, lapses or errors of, of that sort. Uh, and I, I do feel like uh, an access or correction kind of uh, control should be given to all residents at all points of time, uh, mostly because there can be many factors that can lead to these kind of errors. So it's, it's not just, uh, you know, it may not usually be the case of somebody wanting to kind of uh, fudge the data or, you know, try to want to kind of uh, change the date or kind of create any kind of fraudulent uh, information in the database. Uh, but it may also come from a lot of, uh, say, factors like lack of literacy or lack of access to uh, in infrastructures. What if somebody is taking another person with them to kind of create this, uh, fill this enrollment form? Uh, what if there are issues during that process? So, uh, while there can be, you know, the processes can be difficult for the commission itself, uh, it's still important to give the option to everybody to be able to kind of correct this information at any point in time, uh, given that uh, people could realize it after a certain lapse of time also. And uh, while, while uh, as, as the ma'am had kind of explained uh, very uh, kind of accurately about the issues that the commission might face, uh, it, it's still kind of maybe more ideal uh, for, for people to have options of that sort. Also, uh, considering that there's also data harmonization happening, there could be processes in which, say, the database of another sector or another kind of agency has recorded the data wrongly. So what, what can happen in those kind of cases as well? Now, so, so Samia, I, I would love to ask you, yes. now, according to the commission, there are instances where it is clear that this error is not due to illiteracy, 
Right. Now, so the commission is saying there are instances where it is clear that it's actually an act of compromise on the part of the person. Now, so what do you expect the agency to do, I mean, the commission to do in this instance? Mm. Uh, I mean, if, not if there is not actually an... do this because you submitted these details for us. Right, I mean, if so there let, is let a... me have your thought, please. Right. If there's a genuine kind of a mistake in terms of, say, filling out the information wrong or, uh, or you know, there is not enough kind of documentation to back up that information, uh, I, I still feel that people should have that option uh, of correcting or a, a kind of changing information at any point in time. Because eventually, if you think about the information that is being collected, the information belongs to those people. The ownership of data at this point is kind of important to note. Uh, because this is not the information that belongs to the commission. It's, in, it's in information belonging to the people who are going to use this digital ID system. So I, I still feel that that freedom or that kind of uh, right to access and control this information is, is kind of, it lies with the people. And uh, as, as uh, when, it, when it comes to the processing fee, uh, again, I, I feel like, um, since the ID system is, is for everybody, there can be people who may not be able to afford uh, th this kind of a cost to, to such a right. And these kind of basic kind of rights should be made available to everybody, at, I, th I think, at free of cost. Yeah. Madam Adiza, now, like I said, for most Nigerians, they came across the, the so, so, not most, were even asking what is NIA. Some, maybe by, 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 by reason of illiteracy. Now, so my question is, to what extent is the commission engaging the public, particularly going to the level, to the grassroots, to sensitize, educate the people about what NIN represents and what benefits they stand to benefit by getting a road on the scale. All right. Um, Madam Adiza, the question is for you. Yes, I have uh, heard you. Uh, communication is a never ending uh, uh, action. Communication from day one, We've been communicating and we are communicating and we will continue to communicate like my DG said until the last person is registered. And that is till eternity because new, new people, newborns are being born every day. So we'll continue to, to do publicity. We have um, collaboration with states and local government and some religious bodies and uh, even the uh, um, traditional rulers at the, at the level I uh, referring to. And uh, currently we, we have radio programs in local languages uh, for each of the states and, uh, and regions to make sure that the information gets to the ground food. And uh, we have encouraged our partners, the private sector partners that are uh, registering under the, 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 the ecosystem to as part of their corporate social responsibility also wherever they go, they talk um, to the local community in mosques, in churches, in, uh, in the market or any community center or even going to the ward head or village head to educate the person on the, the need for the, what the need is and what the benefits for the need is. And then the government also is uh, as much as possible trying to make sure that uh, uh, government intervention programs are channeled to people that have already been registered with the NIN or to make it conditional for people, uh, ben uh, beneficiaries of those uh, interventions to have the NIN. So it's a continuous thing. It's not that uh, we have done this, we are arrested. No, it's a, it's a daily thing. Communication is a daily thing that we do to the general public. Thank you, Madam, for the mm -hmm. response. Um, there's, there's this question that, um, that came up um, some time ago when, uh, of course, it's still, it's still the, the government keeps um, um, extending the deadline for Nigerians to link their NIN to their SIM card. 
Now, but there was a time that uh, we saw pictures of people scrambling to get enrolled at some of your um, centers. And we, people, many of us got actually um, jittery because we realized that, you know, COVID-19 is still very much with us. Now, so, so, so the question here is that, to what extent has the commission been able to balance the need for, uh, for registration and observance of the uh, COVID-19 protocols. I mean, in order to achieve it, to so the balancing act that, okay, we need to get people registered. At the same time, we need to actually be aware, you know, or be conscious of the, you know, the pandemic we have with us. What has been the step the commission has actually taken this regard? Well, I will tell you that this, your question has been overtaken by events. This is a situation in 2020 that you are referring to. This situation was sometimes uh, yes. between uh, April to, to October 2020. That was when you had those issues. And if you are, if you are being, if you are, uh, if, um, if you have looked at what is going on now, you will not even raise this question. Like I said earlier, when, last year before November 2020, uh, we had just 1,000 locations in our offices for enrollment services. Currently, as I speak to you, I have more than 5,000 locations with over 6,000 equipment. Last day, I was telling you what, what I was referring to is 11, what, less than, uh, than 1,100 systems. Now I have systems close to over 6,000 systems spread across the Federation under the ecosystem with many participants moving fixed and mobile enrollment system going back to enroll. So you can, if you, uh, if you go around NIMC offices, I'm sure you will not uh, have asked this question because you, you cannot find that queue. And secondly, to address the issue of uh, COVID-19 prevention, even at that particular time, we have had support from uh, World Bank and some uh, funding partners that supported us with relief materials to make sure that we protect our staff and disinfect our offices. And then we have put a, we put rule the the the, uh, the social distancing, the use of masks, and then they clean disinfecting our system, the, especially the biometric device and the virus that you sign digitally. We do that. It's part. It's involved as part of our processes in every registration center, and it's still ongoing. And it is also a precondition for certifying any licensee that is setting up a system to enroll in any location nationwide. And even in the there are diaspora licensees, we didn't open reopen their offices until they show us in, until we have a live view of the center in any part of the world and what they have put in in place to make sure that they have all these uh, preventive measures in place. So we, we are abiding by the health and safety rules. Okay, thank you. Let me ask you this question before I go over to Somia. Now, um, yes, you just told us uh, that um, the commission has some private, privately licensed uh, centers, enrollment centers under its um, coordination. And so the question, I want to ask is this, to what extent does the, uh, uh, does the commission um, conduct audit of such centers, particularly given the fact that they are privately owned centers, not um, the NIMSI centers itself. To what extent does the commission conduct audit or monitor of, of the activities? It's a regular, it's a regular thing for now because they are just starting. We just concluded the six month uh, initial enrollment period and uh, we have submitted our report to the Honorable Minister. Like I earlier said in the course of discussion today, that it's not only NIMSI that does monitoring, ICPC does, EFCC does, especially with those issues of extortion that you have um, highlighted. So it's, it's a tripartite uh, distance and we have had requests for Nigerian citizens to write to us, email us, to inform us, those that refuse to pay the bribe, the, the, the money they were requesting, they always write to us with evidence 
and we have investigated, we have penalized airing licenses. Some of them received multiple penalties. Uh, you know, we, we penalize and things like that. Um, I want to say something on what Sonia said on um, the issue of uh, ownership of data. Yes, the data is owned by an individual. NIMSI or the federal government is just a custodian of that data. That is, there's no doubt about that. However, every country has a specific peculiarity. We know what our peculiarity is in Nigeria. There are international standards which we are adhering to, but we have to adhere to those international standards in line, taking into cognizance the peculiarities of the people we are working with. We have to do that because no, we cannot design our system to what is done maybe in France or in the UK or in the US. We have to look at the peculiarities of our people. It's like, for, uh, for instance, somebody coming to tell me that mandatory use of me. Why are you making it mandatory for someone uh, that is uh, going to board, uh, uh, that is going to board a plane to present any? Why must you make it mandatory? Because I know there are talks in Nigeria that will go and buy 100 tickets in a day eh? and, and resell it to somebody. Meanwhile, they will buy with their own identity and then they will resell it to 100 individuals that will come. If you don't require the ID of those individuals boarding the flight, you will not have the, uh, the information in the train manifesto that they were, God forbid something happened. It is the agent's details that you have, not those individuals. Huh? So we know our peculiarities in Nigeria. And uh, when you look at the law, the regulations that we have, uh, on the, they are, they, every individual in Nigeria has the right, free of charge, to demand to review his data in the National Identity Database once a year. Once every year, you have that free right. You have that free right as a citizen, as a person enrolled in the National ID Database to say, I want to view my information. And the mobile app, the e, the EID and the app that we have on the mobile has the ability that once when you go for a service and they verify your identity, it will notify you once you have downloaded the, and you have the app. It will, it will notify you that social person uh, providing this transaction has verified your identity. And you have a right once in a year to send to NIMSI, I want to see who has accessed my data. It is a free right that you do, but you should know that it's a free right for us to provide for you. But if we have to email you a response, or if we have to email you a response, it may be free of charge. But if you write to us and you expect us to send you a letter responding to your query, uh, we have to send it by a registered courier and you have to pay that bill. But that information is there for, because it is not my data. It is not the federal government data. It is an individual data. Hello. Um, Sonia, over to you now. Uh, okay. Madam raised a very vital point. And for me, I, I think our audience need actually uh, to hear your view too. Now, the point is that Nigeria has some peculiar situations. Now, we cannot actually close our eyes to fraud in our system. In fact, prevalent fraud in our system. But again, I want to ask you, should you think we should bend the international standard or global best practices no, and because we have prevalent fraud, or we have to really factor in the fraud in order to have us run a global best practice that can give us a sustainable and good digital identity. So, what, what is your reaction, Samia? Thanks, thanks, Solomon, for the question, and uh, thanks, uh, Lisa, man, for the response as well. 
uh, it's it's a very critical kind of a uh, question again because uh, it's basically again kind of trying to kind of weigh in your options here right like uh, you're looking at uh, the, the fraudulent entries there is kind of possibility of several kind of security risks or kind of uh, you know uh, uh, security towards the public security towards the nation kind of risks and you're kind of weighing it against the basic rights of people so uh, i mean I, when we say international standards we also kind of see uh, these kind of human rights or digital rights that are kind of applicable for every nation right so uh, so i i still kind of believe that uh, to kind of form any kind of a digital id system on the basis of uh, say a reactionary kind of a thing like where we are trying to resolve uh, a certain kind of uh, you know fraud or a certain kind of uh, you know uh, criminal activity kind of a uh, kind of a issue uh, or we should look at the larger benefit or look at the larger kind of uh, you know uh, public uh, benefits or welfare system first so i think it's basically just about prioritizing those kind of uh, legitimate aims of of the digital id system uh, and personally i i do believe that uh, the rights are still kind of you know priority in in this case as well and once you kind of identify that these are the rights that one is to protect and these are the kind of uh, you know certain kind of necessary kind of rights that one one is to protect at all costs and then there could be like ways around looking at uh, the uh, kind of issues of fraud issues of uh, security issues of kind of other other risks that the uh, kind of uh, system as a whole uh, needs to face So, so, um, Sonia, um, in a nutshell, are you saying um, right that is embedded in global best practices should supersede the consideration for um, other factors, you know, like fraud and as I've been mentioned? Are you saying, are you saying such right to override such consideration? in a way yes because i think uh, i mean one is looking at it in terms of uh, you know say in india for instance i can kind of look at the example more clearly uh, because the the id system here was formulated in order to make sure that fraudulent entries in the system get reduced they wanted to reduce corruption they wanted to reduce the costs that are gone into uh, say welfare schemes where people kind of sign up for several uh, you know uh, under, under several names under kind of uh, you know ghost entries and then they would take the benefits uh, of a, of a certain welfare scheme and then several other people would be left out of that welfare scheme and this has been often cited as the most uh, kind of primary reason for which the identity identity system in india had come about so uh, i i do feel like while uh, looking at a certain problem is is you know we are trying to reduce fraud but that should not be the primary aim of a digital id system the primary aim of an id system should be to ensure services to everybody and yes the costs of it could be certain number of you know fraudulent entries but in order to uh, maybe you know cope with that or in order to counter that there should be uh, other kinds of measures and not you know measures that uh, kind of curtail the rights or curtail accessibility to to the people thank you sovia now uh, we are just joining house uh, this is digital identity stories brought by digital lawyers initiative and center for internet and society now this day today this morning this if they depending on your location around the world we are looking at nigeria's digital id the blueprints so now so far so good we have been speaking to madam adisa the governor who identity management commission from india we have uh sovia sendu who is the senior design researcher with the center for internet and society now this morning we just have about 15 20 minutes to wrap up this important and exciting meeting now we've been looking at so many parts of nigeria's digital aid
for fraud, we are the issue of, um, of uh, uh, extortion. We have considered quite a number of things, including the legal framework. So, but we have about three, four questions to go. Now, so Sonia, let me start with you again. Now, as Nigeria is taking on its digital ID project. Now, yes, the project has been loaded for so many reasons because this is one project that will facilitate digital economy. And know what, you know, our digital economy can actually enhance even the life of the lives of the people, their livelihood and everything about them. Now, so if you will have any concern with digital identity design in a developing economy, you know, uh, for example, maybe right now you may be able to compare Nigeria with India. What are your concerns? Right. Uh, sorry, so my. Sonia, did you get my question? Uh, uh, what are the kind of. I could if, uh, if you mean that, uh, what are the concerns currently in the Nigerian ID system? Yes, yes, that, that's the question. Yeah, okay, okay great, thank you. Uh, so I think if I may begin with kind of taking people over a short kind of an introduction to uh, the case study that we've done for Nigeria, uh, so that I can kind of provide a sufficient amount of context before I kind of uh, begin to critically look at it. So uh, I think the, the uh, uh, kind of a methodology that we have adopted uh, is, is to look at uh, systems thinking. Uh, systems thinking is basically uh, uh, a kind of a way of looking at a certain system, in this case, the digital ID system, where we look at different sets of things or at different entities uh, which are connected to each other. And we study these interconnections. We understand what the pattern uh, this ID system could reveal over a period of time. So uh, as part of this, uh, this kind of methodology, we looked at uh, uh, four different countries, Nigeria, India, uh, United Kingdom, and uh, Estonia. And for, uh, for each of these countries, we created a set of say visualizations or mapping. Uh, so say one of them was uh, the process maps in which we tried to map how the identification or authentication processes happen for each ID. Uh, for instance, in Nigeria, we looked at how to enroll for an NIN, how to enroll for uh, EID, how, to, uh, how does the authentication happen for these two uh, kind of components. And uh, while we mapped these processes, we tried to understand what are the different kind of actors who are uh, involved in, in this kind of a process? Uh, what are their, uh, what is their accountability? How is the information shared from say one agency to another? Uh, what does an individual need to do in order to kind of, uh, kind of enroll themselves and get themselves registered and get a, uh, get the, get the NI or the EID? So, uh, Similarly, then we moved on to the different kind of uh, sectors that the ID has been applied in. So we created these kind of systems maps, which are basically maps that connect uh, all the different actors, including the NMC, including uh, say uh, different banks, say in, in, in case of financial sector, uh, we looked at the healthcare sector where we again kind of mapped uh, the hospitals, the kind of uh, how vaccinations are done for this particularly for the, for the e-yellow card, um, what are the different agencies that are involved, uh, how, how does kind of, uh, what are the processes, what, how, do, how does the data travel from one kind of agency to another again. And similarly, we kind of did that for travel sector where we looked at the public transport, uh, the use of EID in public transport in say e enhanced e-passport is I think yet to be uh, applied. Uh, we looked at the welfare schemes. So we looked at how uh, the NIN is used, say, in the uh, pension fund uh, and receiving of pensions after the end of service. Uh, we also tried to look at it in terms of voting uh, and, uh, and kind of insurances, et cetera. So uh, while we were looking at uh, kind of all these mapping systems, we kind of, the idea was to make sure that uh, once we map these out, we kind of, uh, understand the pattern, we understand or we draw insights from each of these mappings. 
So uh, if there is kind of data traveling from different places, uh, we kind of wanted to understand, uh, can this data be minimized? Uh, what kind of points in the processes can cause exclusion? Uh, are there different kinds of uh, grievance mechanisms in place? So I think uh, to me, uh, there are sort of like three or four key kind of critical issues uh, when it comes to the Nigerian digital ID system. And uh, I think one of them is again, very similar to the issue that India also faces, which is the use of biometrics. So uh, I think biometrics have been kind of criticized heavily by several uh, organizations earlier as well. But I think the key issue that happens with, with countries like say India and Nigeria is that uh, a lot of exclusion tends to happen because of the biometric systems. Uh, because a lot of uh, people are not able to uh, record their biometric data, uh, it could be say due to when, uh, due to say uh, manual labor, people who are elderly, people who have disabilities, uh, and their biometrics cannot be recorded uh, clearly. Uh, several other kind of issues can happen because uh, there, can, there can be a lot of privacy related issues or surveillance related issues with, uh, with uh, biometric data collection. Uh, because biometrics is something that you cannot change once recorded and once it's leaked, it's leaked. So if, to depend uh, or to kind of, uh, for the ID system to depend on such a, such a data point is uh, in itself kind of a, a privacy risk. So um, I think while, while a lot of people feel that uh, biometrics is a, is a clear way of uh, kind of recording databases or kind of uh, a more reliable uh, means of recording database. There, there are a lot of risks that it also brings in with it. Uh, if if uh, it also kind of, um, it also means that there is a, you know, a collection of centralized database, which is also the case in Nigeria uh, and in India again. So, uh, that, which means that there is a centralized database that collects all this personally identifiable information on individuals, which could be say biometric data, which could be their date of birth. There could be several other attributes uh, that are connected to this information. There could be, it, it's an easy way of kind of, uh, you know, profiling or uh, discrimination that could be based on profiling. So several, again, you know, harms or risks that are attached to such uh, kind of uh, an ID system. So besides these two, there is also uh, several instances where uh, uh, you know, is the now Swami? I think that okay. yeah. Sorry, Swami. Go on. Okay, so so, so let, let me ask you this. Now, if we are going to look at um, exclusion, privacy challenge, or uh, okay, so so let me leave it at the two. What which of the two will be your uh, greatest or oh, sorry the greater Concern. Which one for which one for which do you have the greater fear when you are looking at the challenges to you know of digital ID in Nigeria? Which one would you rather say in any case this should be taken care of first above every other thing? So issues of privacy challenge or issue of exclusion. Um, I do feel that exclusion is a bigger challenge because uh, that means that you're creating an ID system where uh, one can access services or one can access kind of uh, you know, welfare schemes based on this ID system. And if you're not able to be a part of that system, that exclusion in itself is a, is a much bigger concern. Uh, and I think that is, a, that is a challenge that should be addressed uh, at best first, I think. So, so, so look at that description. I mean, to, to really support your, your view. Yeah, no, 2019, um, the constitutional court in Kenya delivered a judgment, you know, in, um, in a particular uh, case brought on the issue of uh, uh, exclusion because um, some, you know, some issues were raised. Lots of issues were raised in the case, and one of them, which is which um, came very, you know, germane, was the issue of exclusion. And because some cities were saying, no, we do not have, um, uh, pro we do not have insufficient legal protection for privacy, and so until we have that, we are not going to get enrolled and all of that. So, and of course, the 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 the, the court delivered the judgment. Now, of course permitting the government to proceed with 
the registration with the Roman. But of course, in the judgment, issuing, making a declaratory order, you know, that bad from a join a particular service because of non enrollment So for me, I, I think that's actually a huge point for, uh, you know, for uh, inclusivity, you know, and that's actually to avoid the you know, exclusion. Now, well, I, I, I want to ask a question around that, but then I, I think um, maybe I should leave that because that, that question uh, may actually have a, a hugely legal color. You know, that is to look at what, you know, the role of uh, the legal community, particularly lawyers and the courts, when it comes to protecting um, all citizens, you know, from being excluded, you know, on the basis of digital identity. But then I think to a large extent, all of us who agree with the fact that uh, in order to have a good DI, we also have a policy that can exclude any section or some members of the society. Now, but, but let me throw this question to you before I go back to Madam Adiza, which most likely will be uh, my last time of questions with that as we wrap up this uh, event, you know, this moment. Now, my question is this, if you are gonna give any piece of advice to Nigerian government now, what areas will we, we look at it? This whole scheme is a work in progress. What do you think can be done better or be done differently in order for us to achieve a good idea? Right, I think at this point, uh, since uh, the ID system is already on its way in terms of kind of using biometrics and using kind of certain laws in place, uh, I think the, the most kind of uh, uh, urgent advice would be to maybe look at trying to decentralize uh, the data system because currently the the uh, id system that is followed by nigeria is a centralized database uh, which means that all the uh, kind of data that is kind of collected through the process of identification through the processes of authentication goes into one place one database and uh, there's also progress that is being made in terms of data harmonization which is being collected from different other agencies so i i would definitely recommend uh, looking at decentralization of, of databases, which would reduce risks of uh, security, reduce risks of uh, uh, threats of privacy, uh, and, and it would also kind of uh, maybe kind of, you know, make the system entirely a little more uh, easier to follow through also. Yeah. So thank you, um, Samia. Let me go back to Madam Madiza. We have about 12 minutes to wrap up, and I think I just have five minutes with our speakers. It's been an exciting in India and of course, exciting evening uh, for all of our other participants from wherever they're joining the rest of the world. Now, so what I'm at is I have a question for you here. Now, um, for those who claim that, uh, yes, they have, um, they have attempted to get enrolled and um, they have always been, because let, let me first lay a background. Um, in, in, in a number of instances and in a number of roles I've acted, I am actually a witness to commendable efforts of the commission in uh, setting up places, I mean, centers uh, for, for enrollment. And I can tell you today that a lot of enrollment centers around our places, particularly other centers, where uh, you can, when you go there at the time, sometimes you meet just only one person, two persons, you can find uh, a, a, you know, a crowd, you know? And so the question is, now some people claim, I live in rural areas and in my, in fact, from my location to get to a place to get enrolled, I need to spend about, um, spent some substantial amount of money. So what, what is the relief that should be coming their way? I mean, all the agency, the commission is telling us that all rural areas in Nigeria are well covered with enrollment centers. What is, what is your reaction, man? Hello. 
On coverage. Did you get my question, uh, right? Yes, I have. Hello, I, I can hear you. On enrollment coverage, like I told you earlier on, we have close to over 6,000 systems spread across the, the Federation. Yes, uh, for private sector, the drive is for them to make their returns, get the numbers as much as possible. And uh, we know they are mostly concentrated in the cities, no doubt about it. But they will finish the cities. And since they are making, they, is, they are paid in accordance with the number of NIM they generated, that's correct information they do, they have no option but to go to the hinterland. Like I also stated earlier that we just finished the six month review and we have seen where the concentration of the systems are. And going into the second part of the, the second six months, the, the, from now till December, we, have, we are even giving them specific instructions on areas that have not been covered that they need to go down to, to cover. So these are all part of the strategies. In any case, we have three years, three to five years to make sure that we cover every nook and uh, cranny of Nigeria to make sure that all those that are uh, living on the soil of Nigeria within the next three to five years I kept, uh, captured. Then going forward, at least we have our, uh, our offices in all the states of the Federation. We also have, um, we have offices in over 6,000 local government out of the seven, 600, sorry, out of the seven, 707 or so that we have. We have, we are present in more than 600 local governments. And then these same licenses, by the time they mop, the population is mopped up, you know, uh, the Nigerian, um, uh, we increase by, by almost 40 million births every year. So those 40 million births, these same licenses will have recourse to station their, their equipment in hospitals, at uh, community centers and the rest of it so that people can go and register new births and also register that, mind you, it's not only registration for birth that we do, we, we need to rest the identities of those that are diseased. So there's a collaboration and part of the ecosystem is also to digitalize the processes mm -hmm. and uh, systems of the National Population Commission. So that mm -hmm. at a certain time we mop up the country in the next three years, it will be mandatory for any child born to be registered to a birth registration within the first three or four months of birth, a child must be registered. So they, their systems also is going to be digitalized under the ecosystem, the roadmap project. And we will have that interconnection between the birth registry and the national ID registry so that we can get the infl inflow of birth uh, new birth registered and also the, 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 the inflow of the death registration so that we'll be able to map the identities of those people that are dead in our registry. So it's an ongoing process. We are just starting. We are just starting. This exercise that is ongoing is a pilot. The main digital ID ecosystem has not even commenced yet. It is a pilot we are doing to experience what will happen when we go full live with the funding partners. To at least we are seeing the problems, we are seeing areas that we need to improve on, you know, we are seeing the different challenges that will occur when we, are, when we go out there in the field. But even at the pilot stage, for us to, to increase from less than 1,100 enrollment system to over 6,000 enrollment system is, uh, is a huge um, uh, achievement that we have achieved. Yes, it's just, we, we learn every day. And every day we receive comments from the general public, from even the licenses that are all out there in the field, the challenges they are undergoing, we sit back, review, and try to see how we will remedy those situations. And um, I would like to say something on the, the importance of uh, uh, digital ID. I think for Nigeria, the, main, uh, the, the primary importance is for Nigeria to have the data of uh, the people that reside in Nigeria. There's no government that can plan properly for its people if it doesn't know the number of people. It's estimation. Even the fact distribution that is done is on estimation. So we need to know who is where and where people are. We need to know this, the number of uh, the different age group we have so that government can plan for them. The people with the children going into nursery, primary, those that are going into secondary, do we have enough schools to accommodate them? Universities, how many do we need to plan for? You know, 
And uh, even uh, to know the, uh, the work age, you know, those, uh, the number of M uh, unemployed youth that we have so that specific project or assistance can be targeted by the people. And most importantly for some states, they are, the drive is for them to know that who are the taxable people in those jurisdictions. Because in some states it's tax for services. We want to make sure that we don't fail in providing services. But at the same time, the citizens must also commensurate that gesture of government by making sure that they pay their tax when due. We look at Western countries to say things work perfectly, but they pay their taxes. They, they, they do, they, they, you know, every citizen has a responsibility towards its mm -hmm. country, just like the country has a responsibility to its citizens. So it's, um, it's a give and take, you know, uh, both from the citizen and the citizen. So, and then security also, which is a major challenge for Nigeria presently. Security is at the, even the push for the SIM registration. You mentioned something about shifting uh, deadlines. It's not shifting deadlines. It's working with the psyche of our people. The original deadline that was approved, there was a presidential committee that sat down. Every sector gave a deadline by which they will meet. They, will be, they should be able to harmonize. The telecommunication sector gave July as their deadline. But you can't start giving deadline in, this, in November to say by July, register. You trust, you know our people. They will wait until it's one week to register then the crowd will flood in. So the minister in, in his own strategic ways decided to shift the, divide the deadlines into the different distance. But we are at the last phase, phase of shifting because the, the telecommunication sector is supposed to conclude its organization by the end of this July. So July, there's no shifting. I don't know, except if the president approves it, but there's no shifting anymore for the telecommunication sector. So that is it. That's um, um, so yeah. I think that's more that uh, the privacy challenge and uh, okay, something about exclusion also. I have heard something about uh, exclusion, and then the ex. You know, the biometric. What we did with the with this system is to have a three model uh, biometric the face, the iris, and the fingerprints. India started with, went straight to the iris because of their population. Because if, if using the fingerprint in Nigeria, uh, let's say 2% of Nigerian will be excluded with fingerprint. 2% in India is, is uh, millions, uh, thousands of millions that will be excluded, not uh, as compared to Nigeria. But what we have realized is we, we are using the face and the fingerprint but we are activating the iris so that those percentage of Nigerians that will be that um, we may not be able to capture their fingerprints uh, very well, we recourse to the iris. So that's one of the uh, we are we are we are we are opening up it up at the front end because in our system at the back end it's already activated. It's at the front at the time of capture that we have not activated, and it's part of the devices we are introducing in the digital ID ecosystem to make sure that uh, that system is there. And um, uh, as regard to um, the, um, the database being centralized, yes, I don't know, I don't, I don't know in what context, but the national identity management system is, uh, is designed in such a way that um, uh, the different components, the components are separated. Verification is diff the verification system is different from the enrollment system, even though it gets uh, feed from the database. There's a primary database. There's a, we have uh, it, a secondary database, which is also served as a disaster recovery. We have other backup systems that we have. The PKI also is there. What we do is it's a contemp uh, we in compartments, whereby we have a system integrator, which is. Uh, NADRA or Pakistan that integrate the different systems to us. And the database, uh, apart from the primary database and the secondary database, we intend to have additional two uh, disaster recovery sites uh, across some other parts of the country. The two do not reside in the same location, you know, and then the verification, the verification system is independent and different, but inter interact with um, 
get feeds from the uh, primary database. So, and then this different security that we have, we have a robust security architecture that um, we that to protect what we have because we know data is our business. That's what we do, and data is the new oil. And we know that uh, we are lucky in Nigeria, maybe because of the poor internet connectivity. That's why we have not had several attacks. But we have a robust team in house that uh, that is working day and night to make sure that our systems are safe and secure. We make sure that our certification, our licenses, and all the uh, security uh, infrastructure we need to have in place, we need to, we have it. National Identity Management System is a national, critical national infrastructure. So it's under the watch and protection, all the protection that I that is given to critical national infrastructure is given to the National Identity Management System by the federal government. So, every, you know, uh, everything is in place. Yes, and uh, we are not resting. We are improving because security is a moving target. You, we, you always need to be ahead of um, the, the perpetrators or uh, penetrators of uh, systems. So we are, we have ethical hackers in house that works twenty four seven to do that. Really certified staff, all Nigerians. Which uh, at least one thing we can beat our chest is to make is to tell you that at least in NIMSI we promote. Our, we promote our staff. We promote the Nigerian community companies that we have uh, we have brought into the system to make sure that local content of some of the services that are provided by foreign companies, at least first, second, and third level of support, we make sure that they, they, that expertise is given to Nigerian companies to do it. It's only when things have to be escalated that we escalate it to, to our vendors. But we try as much possible to do that. And Nigeria also is on the board of um, uh, OSIA, which is uh, a movement uh, to, to make sure open uh, interfaces for different uh, uh, ID solutions. So uh, my DG is the chair of the advisory council. And we try as much possible to bring all Africans together to make sure that the lessons we have learned from the uh, identity uh, system that we've been operating over years, the different project that we pass it on to our co our sister African countries so that they learn from our mistakes and do not repeat the mistake. And we share information with them. We are always available. They come and even India, we started before India. Actually, even India came to understudy us, but uh, we had, they had um, the political will. So they were much, much ahead of us and the strategy they took to, to decentralize uh, enrollment uh, as against what we started uh, by, we wanted to do the same thing, but the concession failed. So we had a, back, uh, a backlash of almost six, seven years before we are going back to the Indian model now. So it's been, um, it's been an, uh, an educative, uh, educative and challenging experience in NIMSI and uh, we are always improving. We are always improving and we are open to uh, discussions with other like-minded people and uh, in other jurisdictions to share, to rub mind, to see the challenges. And uh, the whole aim is to make sure that we deliver uh, our mandate of uh, providing robust, secure and dependable identity management system for the country. Hello. Yeah, it's been it's been a yes. It's been quite exciting and um, engaging this morning, this afternoon, this evening. And um, on a final note, um, Sonia, what are your parting words to our participants? Thanks, Solomon. So uh, I think I would just uh, uh, like to end with the with the kind of uh, understanding that uh, there are still kind of lots of uh, uh, developments that are happening in digital ID 
uh, lots of kind of haste to develop it to kind of uh, you know there are a lot of uh, benefits for public and pri private sectors uh, it's still kind of critical and important to look at uh, the rights based kind of uh, assessments of these uh, systems uh, while it's very kind of you know uh, it, it, while, while it is important for governments to look at uh, say how how the system is being devised uh, once again, I think the, the, the analysis of the system based on a rights-based approach, based on risk-based approach uh, is very necessary in any IT system and, and it can happen over time for sure. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, great to also so, uh, uh, listen to... Hello. What are you saying to Nigerians? What are your parting words? Well, my parting words to Nigerians is uh, the national identification number is here to stay. As a Nigerian and or as a resident, because the law says we should register Nigerians and legal residents. For those residing in Nigeria, living in Nigeria, you have to register for the national identification number. It has come to stay. It is a civic duty, and uh, it is a right for every Nigerian to demand and go and register. And when anyone demands anything from you, tell them registration is free. And uh, if they insist, send, uh, send, to, send an email to the NIMSI customer care line, or even call any of us that you know in NIMSI and report the location, and we will address it. Thank you so much. It's been a beautiful day. Uh, we have been going through Nigeria's digital ID, the blueprint. Now we have had very exhaustive position. Be quite unlikely. And of course, for those who have been complaining that, okay, I've been exhausted or they wanted to extort me, you have been told that reach out to the commission. Now, and of course, with very Bible claims, let them be proof, take pictures, if you can even have videos, have them recorded and send them to the... As long as you actually give you know, the bribe, you are also deepening corruption in the system. You are encouraging the person who is collecting it. So we want to say thank you so much for our speakers today. Thank you so much, Madam Adiza. Thank you so much, Samia. And all of our partners, you know, and particularly our technical crew, Pranav, Yesha, at CIS, want to say, Thank you so much for making this event a successful one. We look forward to coming back again in the month of August for another edition. So then I want to say, do have a beautiful day. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Okay. Bye.